Welcome to the GitLab 13.4 release showcase, where we'll show you some of the newest features released in 13.4. Hello, my name is William. I'm a technical marketing manager. Today, I will cover a new feature for inline code test coverage right in the merge request view. So what is it? It is a visual representation of code test coverage right in the merge request located in the changes view. Orange when no test coverage was found and green otherwise. Um, why is this important? By having this view available at the moment of reviewing code in a merge request, it is easier to determine if the code has been tested, leading this way to a faster and more efficient reviews that ultimately speed up merge and deployments. Follow these links to learn more. And if you want to replicate my demo, under the demo repo, you can find the project. Let's jump to the demo. So here we are in a project. We can see that Sasha, the developer, has some issues assigned. She selects the first one and creates a merge request, from where she will make some changes to the code. Once she's done with the changes using the web IDE, she will assign this merge request to William for further review. Now we can see that William gets the merge request assigned opens it and under the changes view in the merge request, he can find out if the code has been covered by unit test. This information comes from a code coverage tool used to measure the effectiveness of tests. It can show which parts of your code are being exercised by tests and which are not. This information is available in the merge request, making it easier for the reviewer to approve or not the, the MR and overall speed up the code quality and deployment process. And how do I do that? Very easy. By taking advantage of the power of GitLab CI. In the GitLab CI YAML file, add the necessary scripts to execute your test coverage tool and make sure to save the report in XML format as a report artifact. Hi, everyone. My name is Itzigan Baru, Technical Marketing Manager, and today I will talk about Parent-Child Pipeline and what's new in 13.4. Parent-Child Pipeline is a way to split the long and complex pipeline to small modules. Everything runs in the same project, but uh, instead of running one big pipeline in one CI configuration files, we can split it to small pipelines, smaller folders, in each folder as its own configuration file. The child pipeline behaves like a regular pipeline. It has its own stages and, uh, and uh, jobs, and it runs, when it runs, it runs uh, like a normal pipeline. So what's new in 13.4? Child pipelines now can trigger their own child pipeline. And this is useful for cases that where also the child pipeline become complex. Now GitLab allows another level of, uh, of, of nested uh, pipeline. And currently, it supports nested child pipelines with depth of two. There are discussions to improve it to five, but this is currently we can uh, support only two. So why does it matter? As the pipeline become more co complex, new challenges come with the pipeline. First, uh, the overall execution time uh, become longer. And when we speak about uh, DevOps and CI/CD, we try always to optimize the, the pipeline time. So our child pipeline breaks the normal stages and allow to uh, reduce the overall pipeline execution time. The second thing is that it simplifies the configuration. Instead of having the one complex long file, CI CD YAML file, of course, now you can uh, break it to uh, small modules, which can, uh, it can be easy to manage. And uh, maybe even uh, different teams can manage their uh, module and not the uh, one team need to manage the entire pipeline. Sometimes we use the imports include when we include the, some templates, which is a great, uh, great capability, but sometimes also it leads to complexity. Also, uh, it potentials for namespace collisions where jobs are unintentionally duplicated. So this solves the problems that uh, we have in, with the import includes. We don't, instead of include, you can uh, just uh, trigger child pipelines. There is another advantage is, is the ability in on runtime to determine if you want to 
start or not start a sub pipeline and the ability to dynamically uh, define that and to create dynamic child pipeline for, is very strong for some uh, customers. How it works? Uh, very simple. In the repository, you will need the, for each child pipeline to create a subfolder. In the subfolder, you will uh, add a dot uh, GitLab dash CI YAML file. For each child pipeline, you need its own uh, CI YAML file. And uh, in the parent, uh, the, the YAML file that trigger the child pipeline, you will need the trigger job with uh, this keyword trigger and include the full path of the child configuration file. In this case, Android is the name of the directory. And if uh, now uh, what's new in Turtle Four is that uh, the child can trigger another child, uh, is the same, but you will need to add the full path. Android, Google TV is another directory that I created. Uh, and uh, this is how it works. You can also pass variables from the parent to the child pipeline. And uh, learning more, we have uh, my demo project documentation, and we have uh, and there is a blog for that. So short demo. So I created the special project for parent child pipeline, and so this is the parent. It has two childs, and which are two directories that I created: one for Android and one for iOS. This is the main uh, YAML file. And I have two trigger jobs for the iOS and for the Android. And this is the keyword that I created. And also here, the keyword. And uh, this is how I uh, pass the environment variable to the child pipeline. And let's go to visit the child. So this is my child. And um, it says oh, it's online YAML. And this child also has three children. And uh, again, here I have a trigger job that called to its children, to its child. And if I will open the child, again, it will, uh, it will have its own configuration with two jobs. The last part of this demo is to see the pipeline visualization. And also here there is uh, some improvement in 13.4 about how you um, um, recognize uh, the relationship between child and parent. So two uh, trigger jobs to tri that triggers uh, child pipelines. And this is new. And this arrow, if you click here, it will open the pipeline, the child pipeline. And if you want to know what with the father, this is the new thing that they highlight the father. Same here. You can click here to see this with child and this child, I can click here and see uh, another child, and I can see the full path to the grandfather. From who is the grandfather for this uh, child? This is his father, and this is his grandfather. So, this is a parent child pipeline. It's important uh, for uh, customers because it's useful, uh, it uh, decreases the uh, overall execution time and uh, decreases complexity. So good to know that it exists, play with it. Thank you for watching, bye bye. Hello, my name is Cesar Saavedra. I'm a technical marketing manager at GitLab. In this segment, I'm going to be going over a new feature introduced in GitLab 13.4 called GitLab Kubernetes Agent. What is the GitLab Kubernetes agent? It is a new way to deploy Kubernetes, uh, two Kubernetes clusters. Um, this is a brand new addition to our product. The agent itself runs inside of your Kubernetes cluster and it orchestrates the deployments by pulling new changes from GitLab rather than GitLab pushing updates to the cluster. This is also known as the pool base CICD within GitOps. Why does it matter? So for customers, uh, it matters because uh, many organizations, they cannot uh, open their uh, Kubernetes clusters to the internet uh, because of security, uh, corporate security compliance, or maybe even government security regu regulations. Uh, this new capability will allow them to comply with both types of security regulations. And uh, 
you know, in short, no matter what method of GitOps a customer is using, uh, GitLab has you covered, whether it's the pool-based approach to CI CD, or uh, which is this one here, or the push-based approach to CI CD, which is your more um, conventional way of doing GitOps, which we already we, we already support that. So what's uh, what, why does it matter to GitLab? Uh, so th this new capability allows us to be on par with other competitors in the market that already offer pool-based uh, CI/CD within their GitHub solutions. Uh, so this, uh, you know, now we, uh, in fact, uh, many uh, competitors actually only uh, offer pool-based CI/CD. In our case, we're able to offer pool-based and push-based CI/CD within GitOps. and uh, you know, those two are actually complementary. It's not either or you can use them both in, in um, you can use one of them only or both together combined here are some uh, resources uh, about this uh, new capability there's a link here for to the, to the documentation there's uh, another link to the issue itself uh, as soon as the this video is public i will update this presentation to uh, provide the link right there on the left side of uh, the first uh, bullet and then i also have a much uh, a longer uh, video that is an end-to-end -end demo on how to install GitLab and install the agent uh, on the server side and the cluster side in a demo at how, how the whole thing works. Uh, things to follow, uh, I'm providing here a link to our vision page uh, for this capability. Uh, this is the first release, uh, is the first MVC uh, that we uh, put out for the uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes agent. And uh, right now it has a configuration driven setup. And uh, but in the future, uh, we plan to add a lot more features, uh, like, for example, uh, integration with uh, deploy boards and GitLab uh, managed apps, as well as uh, a UI uh, to uh, configure and set up the, um, the agent on the cluster. All right, so now let's move on to the demo. I have my own instance of GitLab up and running on GKE, which includes uh, the CAS, the Kubernetes agent server. I have also installed the agent on the cluster. Here you see two projects in the GitLab account. The first one is Kubernetes agent, which contains the configuration of the agent itself, which includes the information about what project will be observed by the agent for changes. And now we're gonna to go to the GitOps project. This is the project that is being observed for changes. And we're going to go ahead and edit it. And we're gonna cut and paste something from the documentation. It's just uh, a manifest file that contains an N Nginx uh, deployment. And it's gonna be deployed under, under the same uh, namespace of GitLab agent. And uh, that's Nginx right there. And there are two replicas. So once we save this and it's committed to the main line, uh, the agent will detect that update. And then it'll communicate this uh, to the, the server side. So it's going to communicate this to the agent. Uh, the agent is actually polling. And as soon as it detects the configuration change, it will update the cluster. And as you can see here, you, uh, the uh, agent has already deployed the, uh, the two instances of Nginx. And now, um, so that you can see how modifications can be immediately detected by the agent, we're gonna increase the replicas to three. The agent is gonna detect this change and is gonna go ahead and act upon it and instantiate another pod with a third Nginx, uh, which is right there. Now we have three. So this is uh, a quick demo of the GitLab Kubernetes agent, which allows organizations to use a pool-based CI CD approach to GitOps and without having to expose their Kubernetes clusters to the internet. Hi, my name is Cesar Saavedra. I'm a technical marketing manager at GitLab. In this segment, I want to cover a capability introduced in 13.4, uh, track environments at scale with the environments dashboard. 
Since GitLab uh, 12.5, uh, you can only see seven environments across three projects uh, with the environment dashboard. In 13.4, we introduced an improvement to the dashboard uh, by paginating it uh, to help you support and manage your environments at scale. Uh, you can now see more environments across many projects. Uh, in fact, you can add up to 150 projects for GitLab to display on this dashboard. Why does it matter? Uh, for customers and prospects, uh, you know, usually customers have uh, you know, hundreds of deployments running in their different environments. Uh, besides production, uh, they could have uh, QA, uh, pre-production, integration testing. With this new uh, capability, uh, they are no longer limited to seven deployments across three projects. Uh, they can now support and manage many deployments from multiple projects from a single dashboard at scale. Uh, this new capability can help you uh, detect, identify, and troubleshoot problems faster. Uh, why does it matter to us, uh, GitLab? Uh, it allows uh, us to, uh, I mean, in the introduction of this uh, new impro improvement allows us to better compete in uh, requests for information uh, bids, requests for proposals, as well as uh, uh, proof of concept uh, projects. Here are some resources to uh, read up uh, and learn more about this new uh, improvement. Um, uh, there's documentation there, uh, also the issue for this uh, improvement. And on the right side, uh, you see the link to the CD direction page, uh, which includes uh, the area of the environment dashboard. Uh, and, and these are the, one of the things you could uh, you should follow. OK, so now let's move on to the demo. All right, so the way you access the uh, environments dashboard is by selecting the more menu. And that's how you get to the environment dashboard. And then you click on add project. And let's just search for uh, projects that uh, have the word spring in them. I know uh, uh, projects like that. So there, there, there's one, uh, Spring MBC uh, JPA, and that has actually two running environments. And let's uh, add some more projects. Uh, let's look for spring again and find another project that can that we can add to the dashboard. I think this one is a good one. There you go. That's two more environments. And let's uh, add more projects. Again, let's look for the projects uh, whose name names have a spring, the word spring. And let's scroll down and find more. There you go. That has only one environment. So let's continue adding more projects. So this time let's look for projects uh, that have the name Python in them, in their names. So this new project has two, um, two environments and actually they're failed. You can easily see that they are uh, failed environments. And let's add one more with the name uh, Python in it. And it's gonna add two more. As you can see here, you have a total of nine environments you can add up to 150 projects uh, with this new capability and as you can see it allows you to see all the environments in, on one single dashboard that can uh, help you not just identify and detect problems but also uh, to troubleshoot them faster this concludes uh, this demo thank you very much hey my name is fernando and i'm a technical marketing manager here at gitlab Today, I'm going to show you some of the new features in release 13.4. Now, let me go and share my screen. So the first feature I want to share with y'all is the grant users deployment permission without code access. So what this does is you can give non-code contributors permission to approve merge requests for deployment and deploy code to a um, what is called a um, protected environment. So what you can do here is you can give different people access, different groups access, and different roles access to be able to deploy onto protected environments. 
So one example would be uh, reporters. Uh, you can allow them to approve MRs and uh, as well as deploy to protect their environments. And you may want this because they may be um, some type of testers or some type of customers um, that want to interact with the product and you want them to be able to deploy the new code change to one of their one environment that they belong to. But you don't want them to be able to access the code, but you want them to you know check out the new feature and test out the new feature. So there, what you would do is you would allow them to deploy to their environment. Um, developers, same thing. They should be allowed to develop, push, merge into uh, protected branches, but not into production. So that's like having a dev environment. And within the dev environment, you're giving um, developers deployment access, um, but they won't have deployment access to production because that'll be left for maintainers. And then uh, managers and operators uh, will follow the same flow as as reporters, where you know you want them to be able to deploy to certain environments, test certain features, um, <clears throat> but you don't want them to go ahead and mess with fraud. And why is this important? So for customers, it allows better separation of duties. Um, and it also gives code access to team members that may need to do emergency approvals and deployments. So um, maybe the development environment or the, or the staging environment is broken and developers can't do anything and everyone's on vacation or, you know, different things like that, then approvals can be done by these members and they can also deploy and you can also set managers probably to deploy to production if needed. So that way they have access for that deployment and they would do it in at a time of emergency. So it really enhances our, um, you know, situations like that, uh, enhances uh, testing and just allows more functionality and gives deployment access to those who really need it. Um, and for us, it enhances our CI permission capabilities. So it just enhances our portfolio of, of capabilities we have within permissions. Um, some resources and now let me just show you how it works so uh, it's pretty easy to set up in the project settings you go to the ci cd settings you select protected environments and select an environment so i'm going to say staging and i'm going to allow all developers and maintainers to be allowed to deploy to staging and that's it that's all i have to do And that'll be a protected environment that developers and maintainers are allowed to deploy in. And this can even be changed to individual members or different groups uh, with, which are part of this project. And that's pretty simple. Um, and that goes, and now let's move on to the next feature. So the next feature is a security center. Now this will be a quick one. So what we have done here at GitLab is we've made the instant security dashboard more of a security center. So what we've done is we've kind of moved everything around and made everything a lot cleaner and a lot more organized and it provides a better user experience. So as you can see, the biggest change is the menu structure. So rather than everything being on a single page, everything has been separated into little, um, you know, sub pages. Um, and it just adds all the security related functionality to one page where a user can easily go through. And why does this matter? Well, it provides a better user experience for our customers, makes it easier for them to navigate through the security context and, you know, assess the security posture of projects and groups of projects in more of a natural way without having to jump into different menus and different systems and find uh, everything they have everything up in one place so it just enhances our their experience and for us um, one reason why this is beneficial for us is it makes uh, feature enhancements uh, a lot easier so developers within GitLab can make it a lot easier to develop new features and uh, new things within the security space um, and all the security functionality can be added to one place so that way there's no confusion on where it is uh, here's some documentation and now let's jump into a quick demo and this is how it looks 
So you can see that there's a security tab. And from here, you can see uh, the projects that are here. They're given a different security status, A through F, depending on the severity of the vulnerabilities found. There is a vulnerability over time showing how many vulnerabilities have been introduced and at what time they were introduced. And from there, you can see that you can easily access the vulnerability report that will have um, the different vulnerabilities within every space and can be sorted. Um, can be sorted by status, severity, scanner, and project. And then you can also see that the settings are available as well. So you can keep adding different projects um, to build your whole instance level security dashboard. And yeah. And now to move on to the final feature, which is the most exciting one for me, is using HashiCorp Vault Secrets and CI Jobs. Now, what was added here in 13.4 is a new secret syntax uh, for the GitLab CI YAML, which is a secret syntax. And what this does is it allows uh, GitLab to draw secrets and different variables that are stored as key value pairs in Vault and allows them to use them on your CI job. So um, a few things to consider about this, Vault is required. Um, there needs to be secrets in Vault and there needs to be a JWT authentication enabled in Vault and needs to be uh, uh, enabled in GitLab as well. And um, Vault needs to be configured and needs to be able to communicate properly. Uh, needs to You need to be able to communicate to Vault through a public IP. So it needs to be, the Vault needs to be exposed externally. Um, and just to consider Vault can be run on Kubernetes as well. So it does require some, some setup with Vault. Um, the, the piece that we've introduced is just being able to easily call Vault with certain syntax once uh, Vault has already been set up. And I'm planning to make a, a demo video on this on how to set up Vault properly and uh, gathering some resources and editing documentation. But for now, I just want to highlight this feature. So why does this matter for our customers? Um, so it adds extra protection to GitLab environment variables by having a secret storage, which is Vault. And number two, it makes it easier to actually access these uh, protected environment variables from Vault by using specific syntax. And for us, it's good because it, it I mean, the user, it makes the user experience a lot easier, um, <clears throat> a lot better, but also it adds another great integration to our portfolio and HashiCorp is one of our partners. So we can, you know, it helps us keep integrating different uh, features, uh, different HashiCorp features like Vault. Um, here's some information. And now let me just let me just show you this. So let me share the terminal real quick. Okay. So in my vault, there's a few things that I have set up. So I have a policy, and my policy says that within this path, I can read and list secrets. So this is my path on vault OPS data staging secret. And within that path, I have different key value pairs. And uh, um, I'm only able to read and list it based off that policy. Then I have a role. And this role, what it does is it maps to my project ID. So this is my, so this is only accessible from within my project. Um, and it uses my policy that I've defined up here. So within this project, on this space, I can um, I can read and list everything in this on this path. So that's my role. And then I have a um, key value pair. So I've set I've created a key value pair um, with a key foo and the value world. And this is secret it's hidden in Vault and um, it's using uh, KVV2, so the KVV2 secret um, engine. And then from there, uh, so now we, we want to be able to access this uh, from GitLab. So how do we do that? So let me share Chrome again. 
so, so I've created this project that's my Simply Simple Notes vaulted and a few things to check out. So in the CI YAML, in my deploy staging job, I use this secret syntax. So I'm, I have, uh, I'm using the secret syntax and I'm saying, um, make an environment var variable named foo and populate it with what's in staging secret and the value, uh, the, the key foo at ops, which is the head directory, which is slash ops slash staging slash secret. And then the key is foo. So it's going to populate this with a file that it extracts. And that file is going to contain the value of foo. And then here I'm going to echo foo so you can see what it is. And I'm going to cat foo so you can see what's in that file. So I'll show you the location of the file and the file. And then um, you can see there's three environment variables required. One is the URL for the vault server. One is the auth row uh, that I'm using. And one is the auth path, which is JWT because it is a JWT authentication. So this, this will be pretty standard. That needs to be set up anytime you're extracting secrets. So now, let me go ahead and show you the job. So if you look at this job, you can see that if I echo foo, it gives me a uh, path to a temporary file, uh, a temporary directory with the file foo in it. And you can see that once I, um, you know, cat foo, you can see world, which is the value of that key. So that's pretty much um, the vault uh, integration and new syntax in a nutshell. And um, happy to have shown you these features from 13.4. So, um, you know, please uh, reach out to us on the technical marketing Slack and, you know, let me know if you're interested in, you know, any demos on these features and highlighting these, uh, these main parts. Uh, thank you. So here we are with the uh, Atlassian developer page, the developer.atlassian.com. This is where we are going to uh, set up Atlassian as OmniAuth provider. Uh, what we do uh, is go to this URL up here, and then we're going to create a new app. Um, we'll get the app name GitLab. Agree. Go ahead and create that. And then uh, this is going to give us a client ID and a uh, secret. Um, so we're gonna go make sure that we copy uh, both of these. Um, and left sidebar, we'll see under um, APIs and features, we'll click OAuth 2.0. And then there we will call back URL, we'll enter uh, our URL. We can see that it's an example right here. Um, so you'll switch that out. Um, go ahead and save those changes. Our app doesn't have any APIs. Um, and then uh, we'll go ahead and click add. Go to the Jira platform rest API. Click that. Configure. And then we'll add the view Jira issue data. I will also add view uh, user profiles, which has already been added, so we don't need to remove that. And then um, create and manage issues. And we have our app. For the GitLab configuration, on your GitLab server, open the configuration file. Uh, you either use Omnibus or uh, source installation, uh, either of these codes. Um, for the provider configuration for Atlassian, same thing, you'll use Omnibus uh, or so a source uh, installation code uh, that's specific to each. And then you'll change your client ID and your client secret uh, to the client credentials that you received in the application registration steps we went through. Save that configuration file and then reconfigure or restart GitLab for the changes to take effect. 
if you installed GitLab via Omnibus or from Source, respectively. And then on the sign-in page, there should now be an Atlassian icon where the regular sign-in form uh, is located and click the icon to begin the authentication process. And if everything goes right, the user is signed in to GitLab using their Atlassian credentials. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please hit the subscribe button. And remember, here at GitLab, everyone can contribute.